Our Father, we thank you for reminding us once again that our whole ministry is to lift up Jesus Christ. We thank you for the time past as you have given us privileges and opportunity and as you have given us special ability and anointing to lift up Jesus Christ. We know that every time we have yielded unto your hand, under the power of your hand, every time we have yielded to what you have instructed us to lift up Jesus Christ, we have always seen that men, women, and children are turned and drawn unto the Lord. Our prayer tonight is that you help us to be more consistent in lifting up Jesus Christ. Help us to lift up Jesus Christ with greater power, with greater wisdom, with greater knowledge of the word of God and what the word says about Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray, every moment we stand up to preach, every time we counsel, every time we live before people, every time we give testimony, whatever we do, Lord, we pray that more and more, higher and higher will be lifting up Jesus Christ. Amen. That will also assist us in the way we live and in the way we preach. That will lift Jesus so high that all people, all sections and professions of people will see Jesus highly lifted up. And they will see the beauty in Jesus. The redemption in Christ. The salvation he has purchased for us. And Lord, many people will always be drawn unto the Lord. Where we have not had enough wisdom, enough understanding, and enough courage, and enough ability to lift up Jesus as high as possible. Give us that wisdom in this conference. Give us that power in this conference. That we will go from this place and we will not lift up any other thing, any other one, but Jesus, the Savior of the world. It is when we do this effectively and effectually that we'll be able to lead your people to the desired place. We trust you will help us. And we're going to do it more than we've done it before. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We're having another session of leadership studies. And this time we're going to have study two. Qualifications of a biblical leader. Let's look at Exodus chapter 18. Verses 21 to 26. And I'm appealing to you that you will open up to the spirit of God. So that as these references are read, you will note the points therein. So that if we're not able to comment on every verse that is read, you would have yourself been preachers of the word, got some things the Lord will want you to take to heart in the verses and passages we're reading. Exodus chapter 18, from verse 21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee. But every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself and they that bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so. Then thou shalt be able to endure. And all these people shall also go to their place in peace. 
So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And he judged the people at all seasons. They had causes they brought unto Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. We're talking about qualifications of a biblical leader. And here, early time, among the people of God, the question came up, or the need came up, that leaders ought to be chosen. And then, qualifications were expected. I want you to notice in verse 21, moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men. And in verse 25, and Moses chose able men. Stop there for a moment. When you talk of men of ability, what do you think about? Do you think of superstar? Do you think of people who are physically well built? They never get tired. They can run any length. They can climb any mountain. They can face any situation. Well, some people have that picture of leadership. And if somebody is not that well built, and he doesn't have the great physical energy they're looking for, they think he's disqualified. When he talks of men of ability, what will you be looking for? Will you be looking for somebody who has read the encyclopedia and is immersed and baptized in the encyclopedia? His bank is a, a bank for data. He can call any form of information, anytime. Well, that's what some people think the Bible means when it says men of ability. Or when it says men of ability, able men. Are you thinking of people who have arrived? They've known everything they ought to know. They've learned everything they ought to learn. And they don't need any other thing. Well, let me submit to you. That in this passage we have read, able men is so well qualified that none of us needs to go to any extreme. First, it tells us something very clearly. That these able men are not people that have arrived. They know all things. They can do all things. Because, he says, they will judge the small matters. And they had matters they will still bring unto you. And in verse 26, it says, they judged the people at all seasons. They had causes they brought unto Moses. So that clears up something to start with. That as we talk about qualifications for a biblical leader, we don't need to be despondent and look at some other people who by the grace of God, God has put some, something more in their lives that maybe we do not have at present. Although qualifications are required, God is not looking for necessarily superstar or a bank of data, a person that is almost a walking encyclopedia. If we have such people, we're grateful to God because they are rare. They are not many. And if God has blessed the church with a few people who are that great in leadership that they have this information, that information, this experience, that wisdom. They are really able men. We thank God. But at the same time as we are thanking God, we say not everybody has to be like that before he's used of God. And that kind of makes me a little bit happy. Because if God had waited for me, to be a man of ability in that sense 
of being a walking encyclopedia. In that sense, of being a bank of data. Just having all information you can think about. Having the height of experience. Maybe I never would have started. Maybe the same thing with you too. That the qualifications we're talking about, they are basic things. And they are not things that will show that I've got it all. They are just basic. And by the grace of God, we can build on them. Let's also see something. That when it says able men, it then breaks it down. And it says in verse 21, such as fear God. Such as tremble at the word of God. Such as honor God. Such as anywhere he is, when he thinks about God, and he knows that God sees him anywhere he is, he acts, he moves, he speaks in the fear of God. And then, men of truth. Now, men of truth doesn't mean actually he knows all the truth there is to be known. Why do we say that? Oh, because if he knows all the truth there is to be known, he can deal with small matters and hard matters. But the truth he knows, he watches it. He keeps to it. He abides by it. And he will speak the truth in his heart, hating covetousness. That doesn't mean temptation will not come. But when the temptation comes, he hates it. He fights against it. He prays against it. And he appeals to the Lord that the Lord will help him not to fall into that kind of thing. Then it says, place such over them. You see, the qualifications they are very basic. They are not things that are so high that those who have been Christians for 10 years, 20 years, will be stretching and stretching. They'll never be able to touch it. It doesn't, the qualifications here are so basic that it's not requiring something that somebody who dedicates himself to the Lord, who loves the Lord, and who is praying, oh God, help me, I want to be my best for the kingdom of God, that such a person will be denied by God. No, it's not like that. Simple, basic, fear God. And also, make sure that you are a man of truth. And you hate covetousness. And you are humble enough when a matter is hard that you cannot deal with, you cannot handle, you are able to pass it over to people who know better than you know. Let's look at Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, chapter 19, from verse 5. And he said, Judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Take heed what ye do, for ye judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. Moreover, in Jerusalem, the Jehoshaphat said of the Levites, and of the priests, and of the chief of the fathers of Israel, for the judgment of the Lord, and for controversies, when they returned to Jerusalem, and he charged them, saying, Thus shall ye do in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a perfect heart. Again, we have the qualifications here repeated, but slightly in some different words. Here these leaders were told that in your leadership capacity or role you are doing everything you do for the lord that means if we say it in our own language now work and minister as in the presence of the lord wherever you are be conscious that the lord is there whatever you say whatever you do however you minister make sure that you are doing as the lord expects you to do 
And you know that his eyes are watching you. Then he says again, do it in the fear of the Lord. And now he explains the fear of the Lord. That as there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, no respect of persons, and no taking of gifts. So then, if we fear the Lord, we will not allow iniquity in us. If we fear the Lord, there will be no partiality or respect of persons. If we fear the Lord, we will not take gifts to blind our eyes. Then in the latter part of verse 9, it says, Do what you do in the fear of the Lord. If we fear the Lord, how are we going to do whatever we do faithfully? And then we'll do it with a perfect heart. Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. From verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And he chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Again, qualifications are given here. And, you know, whenever we read these qualifications, it is possible that we can translate these qualifications very deeply. But the fear I have is that sometimes, if we're too deep, and we fail to rightly divide the word, we may have some problems. We may so explain the qualifications expected that nobody is qualified at all. But what you see is that in all these qualifications that are read out, that we're reading out in the Bible, when they finish giving the qualifications, they found enough people to use. I will say then, if we interpret these qualifications and we make the qualifications so high, unattainable that nobody can reach and therefore we're not able to have people that can get involved in the work of the Lord I think that may indicate that we have misinterpreted the qualifications on the other hand the qualifications are so were so understood in the New Testament church and in the Old Testament too that not everybody qualified I think too, if we explain or interpret all these qualifications as if every Christian is qualified to be a leader, every Christian in the whole church, I think there will be misunderstanding or misinterpreting the qualifications. The best is that we just stay with the word. We don't go to this extreme of adding something to it that is not there. We don't go to the other extreme of taking something significant away from the passage that we know obviously is there. Let's look at it. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report. That just means, look at all the activities that they have been carrying on in our midst. Don't look at what they did before they came to Christ, because if you look at that, nobody will be of honest report. Think about that. Many times when we're looking for the qualifications for leadership, we go so far back in the lives of the people that some of us, unfortunately, we even begin to talk about what happened before these people were born again. Well, my brother, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if we go so far back into the life of any and every individual to the time they were not born again, 
you're not going to find any man who is of honest report, but men of honest report. Since they came to Christ, and they've been living among us, and they've been going in and out, do we find them to be honest and truthful, standing in the word, standing by the word? That's one of the qualifications. And then full of the Holy Ghost. Well, again, when we talk about the fullness of the Holy Ghost, I don't know yet anyone who is so full of the Holy Ghost that he cannot be filled up all over again. You know, in Acts of the Apostles, don't open, I'll just read to you. In Acts chapter 2, it says, they were all filled of the Holy Ghost. Then it comes to Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. And the people, the council, they asked Peter and John. They said, how is it? By what authority have you done this? And before he opened his mouth to begin to speak unto them, we're told Peter was full of the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost. And then as we go on in that same chapter, the latter part, we read about being filled with the Holy Ghost again. And then you go on and on. And you see that the people that were filled and full before, they are filled again. So we are saying, when we say we're looking for people who are full of the Holy Ghost, obviously, we want people who will not just be talking from their head. We want people who have touch of the Lord. They have been saved. They have been sanctified. Their hearts have been purified. Not only that, they have been immersed in the Holy Ghost. Immersed in the Spirit of the Lord. But then, even though they are full of the Holy Ghost, there is still chance to be filled more and more. As situations will demand more infilling in your life. I'm still coming back to that... Um, chapter chapter 6 but just turn over about it about a sheet in your bible chapter 7 verses 54 and 55 and when they heard these things they were caught to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth and he this is talking about stephen one of the seven people that were chosen as a result of being full of the holy spirit but now we are told, he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. The point I'm making is this. One of the qualifications is that we'll be full of the Holy Ghost. But again, don't interpret it in such a way that we will look at everybody and we'll say nobody is qualified that will be a wrong interpretation there are people who are full of the holy ghost yet they are not so full that there is no possibility of adding to the infilling they can still be filled more so one of the qualifications is that they should be men that are full of the holy ghost and let's go back to chapter 6, verse 3. And wisdom. And wisdom. Isn't that something? You know, if you judge people wrongly, you can disqualify everybody on this side. But as you look at life, there are times you will have to accept. When you look at a little child, maybe a child of five a child of six and you will say the child is wise but you don't mean that the child is wise as his father you do not mean that the child is as wise as he could ever be there are some children that seem spectacular I heard of a particular child now many years ago. The child has now become uh, old, ministered, and is even, uh, I think, gone home to glory. But when he was the age of five, going to six, the mother was 
uh, wanting to go to bed. And this boy wanted to recite a particular story in the storybook for children. And the child recited the story. And uh, the mother was so impressed. But the mother felt that she didn't want to go to bed or the child go to bed with the Bible, with the story. That is just a normal story that children read. She didn't want to go to bed with just that. And said, uh, my child, my boy, I appreciate what you've done. But before we go to sleep, recite for me one of the Psalms in the Bible. The age between five and six. And you would have thought the child will pick up the shortest Psalm. The child began to recite Psalm 119. From verse 1 to the very end. And never missed a word. Now, you cannot judge all children by that standard. If you do, you are going to disqualify all other children that they don't have wisdom. We're not expecting the wisdom of an angel. We're not looking for the wisdom of Gabriel. Neither are we looking for the wisdom of an apostle from everybody. And when a situation that is at your level comes to you, all that God is looking for is that you depend upon him. And then you have the wisdom. You manifest the wisdom to be able to get the work done. These people, they wanted to choose. They wanted to choose men to serve tables. They were not choosing apostles at this particular time. So when they refer to wisdom, they were not comparing these people with Peter and John and James and the rest of the people. They, it's a qualified kind of wisdom. It is not a kind of wisdom that doesn't have capacity to grow. Once again, let me remind you that all these qualifications we read about, we have to stay in the middle. We have to so interpret these qualifications that we'll know that this is exactly what the Bible is asking for. That is not asking for angelic wisdom. It's not asking for the kind of wisdom that Adam might have heard before the fall. When he just came out newly in the hands of the Almighty God. We're just looking for the wisdom that will be appropriate for the work that this person is being called to. And yet all the same, he should have wisdom. It should have wisdom as he reads from the word of God. It should open up to the Lord that the Lord will give him wisdom in the word. As he goes through experiences in life, he should be able to pray and manifest the wisdom that will be able to get through all the various things that he needs to do in life by the wisdom of God given unto him. And when he needs a word of wisdom, from the Holy Spirit. He should be able to depend upon the Lord that the Lord will give him a word at a time, a word in season. So then, full of wisdom, that we may appoint over this business. Verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer. One of the qualifications also is that we should be prayerful. We should be prayerful. Again here, it is not that you have arrived in your prayer life, prayer level, that there is no possibility of increase, no possibility of improvement. But at least there should be this qualification that will put in that you show your dependence upon God. That you need his strength, you need his power. You rely upon him. Because of the need you feel in your life, you are a person that is given to prayer. That the best message cannot touch any life, cannot save any soul, except God anoints that message and he puts something within that message that will quicken the hearts of men and convict the hearts of men. Because of that, a person realizing his inadequacy will have to pray. And so, one of the qualifications says that there will be people who are given or committed to prayer and also to the ministry of the word. That means a person will love the word, read the word, understand the word, 
That doesn't mean that he understands every difficult passage in the Bible, but he understands enough to be able to teach the people of God and feed the people of God. So then, this, uh, as we look at this, we need to understand that qualifications are required. And if we stay with the balanced interpretation of the word of God, we will see that some are qualified. We may see that some are not yet qualified, but in a short time to come, they are likely to be qualified. We may see that some people are not qualified yet, but if we help them, if we encourage them, if we pray for them, if we counsel them, we will bring them to the position whereby they may be qualified. We may even discover that some people seem to be qualified, but they do not have the call of God into that ministry, into that area. That means that we should stay a little on the call of God for the minister. So turn back to page 8, the call of a leader. The call of a leader. We're talking about qualification. But you see, anybody could just look at all these qualifications and he can say that, I think I'm qualified. At least I'm born again. At least I'm sanctified. At least I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. At least I read the Bible. And I think I have all these qualifications we're talking about. Because you see, by and large, in a particular proportion, every born again believer will have a measure of the fear of God. Will have a measure of being a man or a woman of truth. Every child of God will have a measure of hating covetousness. Every child of God will have a measure of not being partial, not being a respecter of men. Every child of God will hate gifts and will hate to be a false witness. Every child of God will like to have wisdom that comes out of the word of God. Every child of God will like to develop his faith, will like to be full of the spirit of God and get on being filled and filled and filled of the spirit of God. And yet, not every child of God has a call to leadership. And so the call to leadership is very, very important as we now look at the leaders that are developing themselves so that they will not fail God. They will not disappoint God. Now, let me just read this to you, page 8. Under the section, the call of a leader. Some are called by God, but rejected by men. You know, it's a sad story. When somebody is called by God, but rejected by men. And that has happened over and over. They almost lost the leadership of Moses. Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Will you do this to me? He hammered on what he had done wrong before. And yet, the Lord had called the man. But at that time, they couldn't receive him. They almost missed the ministry of Amos. The Lord had called him, but he told him that he shouldn't minister. Although he continued to minister. How about Jesus Christ? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, he gave them power to become the children, the sons of God. How about Paul the Apostle? It were with him. This man is not free to, it's not, um, it's not, uh, he should not leave. It's not fit to leave. God called the man, but some men rejected. I hope our churches don't do that. That a man is called of God, appointed by God, and sent by God to a particular place. But the men of that place gang together, they reject him. Let's recognize the call of God. On the other hand, others are chosen by men, but God rejects them. And he denies them of his approval. And denies them of the Spirit's anointing. I think we see that all over the world. In many, many denominations, that there are some people who have been appointed and chosen by men. But God says, you can give him title and position, but I won't give him the power and the anointing. That's a dangerous thing. Blessed is that church 
that recognizes the call of God upon his chosen servants and gives those servants of God the liberty to minister and to fulfill their ministries. There are self-appointed leaders who assume leadership in presumption and pride. There are man-appointed leaders who are given leadership privileges as a favor from carnal, uninspired men. We have to face the reality. Few are God-appointed leaders. It is dangerous and disastrous to be self-appointed or to be man-appointed. But on the other hand, what a great gift. When a leader is divinely appointed, and that divinely appointed leader is given to a church, what a great gift that will be. Now, as we talk about the call of God, you know, it's uh, similar to some stories we listen to in marriage. Somebody comes out to give a testimony on how they knew the will of God in marriage. And he talks about knowing the will of God in marriage, all that he saw, all that he experienced, and the revelations that came to him, and the time it had been coming to him, how God gave him the name and the place and everything. And you are still praying for the will of God. You say, if that is the only way God reveals his will to people in marriage, I don't know whether I will ever get married. Well, don't compare yourself to those people. God talks to different people in different ways. Do you understand? The same thing with the call of God. You listen to some people that have been called of God, and thank God they are called of God. And you, uh, you know, listen to the testimonies they give. And how the call of God came upon them. If you are not careful, you listen to some of those things and you say, I wonder whether I will ever recognize the call of God. Because that one I had just blew my mind and made me to feel I may never be able to get it. But don't get discouraged. God called Samuel and he didn't even know God was calling him. And there are people that God is calling. And because of their inexperience, they don't even recognize God is calling them. Let us look at this page eight. God calls different people at different times in different ways. So don't compare yourself with anybody. God calls Samuel and Jeremiah at an early age through the word of the Lord. On the other hand, God called Joseph through the word of the Lord in a dream. Not everybody has the dream, but some do. Aaron was called by God at the age of 83. Through God's audible voice to Moses, coupled with a driving, compelling force within Aaron himself. How about Moses? Moses was called at the age of 80 by God through the angel of the Lord at the burning bush. How about Elisha? Elisha was called by God through divine revelation to Elijah. And it's coupled with inner confirming witness of the spirit within Elisha himself. You remember Peter? He was called by God through Christ's drawing power, the miracle of provision, and tender call into service. Now we come to Paul. He was called by God. Through the Lord Jesus Christ appearing to him in a dramatic, thundering, blinding event on the road to Damascus in the midst of his opposition against Christ. He calls different people in different ways at different times. Therefore, just listen to the Lord and the Lord will stamp it on your heart. You will be able to recognize the call of God. Each of us must be sure of the unique way and the valid call of the Lord and from the Lord upon him into the ministry. And as a person becomes sure of um, the call of God upon his life, he should be seriously thinking of the qualifications of a biblical leader. As I've said at the beginning of his call, and at the time he answers that call, he will see the qualifications in a measure. But all those qualifications are still capable of being improved upon, of being increased. 
He has the capacity to grow in all the things that God has impacted in his life that makes him to even step into the ministry. A person that feels because I'm qualified now, that means I've reached the end of being qualified. I think it's mistaken. Till we see the Lord face to face, we'll be improving and increasing in the capacity for leadership. Let's turn now to page 9. Much has been said and written about leadership in the church. But as it is so often the case, the emphasis in many circles has been physical fitness, academic qualification, professional experience, social qualities, and success management principles, rather than spiritual qualifications that are demanded by God. It is unfortunate that in our world and in the church at large, ministry has been confused with management. In the world and in the church at large, the manager has replaced the minister in many churches. Secular knowledge has been exalted above scripture knowledge. And worldly wisdom has very often taken the place of wisdom from the word of God. Many times, the professional manager is often respected and accepted before and above the praying minister who is anointed with God's power. The man who is experienced in money management and finance often sees himself more qualified in leadership than the man who is experienced in mountain moving faith and prayer that impacts earth with heaven's resources. These things ought not so to be. And if you, by the grace of God, discover that you have the spiritual qualifications, you may be lacking in some social things. You may be lacking in a physical ability and physical uh, personality. You may be lacking in some other things that we see in managers in the world. But if you have the qualifications that are written in the Bible, don't get confused. The hand of the Lord is upon you. And whatever it is you need of the other physical and little, little things, the Lord is able to add to all, all that you've got. But the spiritual is much more required than the physical, than the academic, than the social. For leadership in the church, physical, academic, social qualifications and qualities are not as important to God as many of us regard them. I'm sure you'll like to read those references later on your own. Christian experiences are necessary as foundation to all spiritual qualifications for leadership in the church. That means the experience of being born again. Because, you know, the blind cannot lead the blind. And the experience of sanctification, how we need to be sanctified and purified and purged circumcised in the heart to love the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. To be able to serve God adequately and minister effectively. And the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Immersion in the Holy Spirit. How we need that very much. Let's just consider two areas of qualification. Number one, character qualification. Number two, commitment qualification. Character qualification. Let's look at this. In Numbers chapter 12, Numbers chapter 12, verse 7, my servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. Wonderful. That God could testify about a man that is faithful in all my house. Second Samuel. Chapter 23, verse 3. Second Samuel, chapter 23, verse 3. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. If you are taking note, I think now we're meeting, having the fear of God in quite a number of places. 
And it is very significant. And you know, Jesus Christ himself even said it. He said, I will tell you whom you will fear. Fear God. So then, the fear of God is still expected in leaders today. First Samuel, chapter 12. First Samuel, chapter 12, reading from verse 2. And now behold, the king walketh before you. I am old and gray-headed. And behold, my sons are with you. And I have walked before you from my childhood until this day. Behold, here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith? And I will restore it to you. And he said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day that ye have not found aught in mine hand. And he answered, he is witness. You can see from what Samuel was saying about himself, and the way he told them to witness against him, if there was anything they wanted to witness against him. And they said, we're witnesses. And we know that the Lord has really helped you in leadership and missed us. And he said, God is witness also. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 10. Ye are witnesses, and God also. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. We behaved ourselves. That's talking about conduct and character. Character is very important. And as you look at the qualifications we've been reading about in the Bible for leadership, you will see that character qualifications take a major part. What's character? I'm reading up from page 10. Character is a sum total of all the qualities in a person's life exemplified by one's thoughts, habits, values, motives, attitudes, feelings, and actions. Character is not only what a person, it's not only how a person acts, it includes the inner thoughts and the motives and the attitudes producing the action. Character is not what a person thinks and says and does when he is not under pressure and temptation. True character is revealed by what we are when temptation, pressure, and afflictions come. Character is not only what is not only that behavior or conduct which other people see on the external, it is also that which people do not see, known to God and to ourselves. Character is not only how a person relates to and treats members of his spiritual family. It includes how he treats his wife and children and members of his natural family. Character is what the person is before God, what he is before his conscience, what he is before all people at all times in every situation and every condition of life. A leader must be of noble character before God and before all men. And it is the responsibility of every leader to always check and examine his character. Not only the gifts, oh, the gifts are beautiful and wonderful and edifying. Not only the talents, so oh, we need those talents, all the talents we can have, but character, character. 
what we think, the motives we have, our attitudes and dispositions, our feelings and our actions, and what we are under temptation and pressure and affliction. Let us make sure that before God, we're always going to him saying, oh Lord, build a noble, solid character out of me. To be approved of God, the Christian leader must have divinely required character in his spiritual life. He must have it in his personal life. He must have it in his marital family life. He must have it in his uh, ministerial life, financial life, social life, and educational life. Godly character produced by the depth of understanding in God's word and regular devotional prayer life is the foundation of everything else in a leader. You see the way a leader takes the Bible, reads the Bible for himself, studies the Bible for himself, and he allows the Bible to mold his character, to break him, to melt him, and to mold him. You see, that is the foundation of everything else a leader will do. The scripture-based principles, habits, and patterns of lifestyle, which a leader develops and personally maintains, will greatly affect his ministry. You know, sometimes, uh, before we really get into a place of honor, a place of great responsibility in the household of faith, we take time to develop Christian character, Christian conduct. But for many people, immediately they, they get to that position, then they forget about the need to continue maintaining that character. That's the pitfall that many people are falling into. Please watch it, that you do not fall into that same pitfall. A leader in the church must be a balanced head, father in his own family, in his own home. Why? A shattered home life cannot produce a successful church ministry. And a leader's friends, very often, will reflect the kind of person he is. If a man has real Christian character, his social life will not destroy his God-given ministry. Do you know, my brothers, your social life, your interaction with people, the people you accept very intimately into your life, and make people to look at you and reject your ministry. You may be a good person. You may be called of God. And you might have developed some real sterling qualities in your life. But if you make a mistake in your social life, and you are so familiar, and you take into your very life, very intimately and closely, people of questionable character, it may destroy the God-given ministry that the Lord has favored you with. Ministry functions cannot be carried on without the support of the leader's character. What a man is in the heart and life always affects what he does in the ministry. And as we look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, we see that character qualifications form the basis of the leader's ministerial life. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. From verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, that simply means of an overseer, of a leader. He desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife. Vigilant. Sober of good behavior. Giving to hospitality, he loves people. Apt to teach. He likes to teach people. Not giving to wine. Whatever will intoxicate him and take over the control of his mind, he doesn't take it into himself. No striker doesn't fight. Not greedy or filthy looker, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. 
For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach or the snare of and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must be must the deacons be grave, not double tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy or filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 14. These things write I unto thee hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. I've read this passage slowly, deliberately, so that in the intervals of my stopping between the various phrases, you have been able to look through and consider that a lot of these qualifications they affect the character. It doesn't say something here of the physical look. It doesn't say something here of physical energy. It doesn't say something here about much about administration. It doesn't say something here about being a university graduate. It talks about character. If somebody is a university graduate, oh, I will praise the Lord. And if somebody is a great administrator, I will glorify the name of the Lord. But you see, your calling brethren, how that not many mighty after the flesh, not many noble, not many wise are called, but God has chosen the foolish things and the base things to confound them that are mighty. You know, in the sight of God, character is greater than any other kind of physical, academic, educational, social qualification. As we look at this, as we look at all the things we have read, can we summarize these um, qualifications? Yes, we can. But before I read the summary of all these qualifications, once again, I want to remind you that you may read these qualifications and think, can I ever make it? Remember? You can, by the grace of God. Amen? Amen? We may not be everything we ought to be now, but God has seen all that. And he has placed a lot of us on le in leadership. And what the Lord is requiring is that we will see our shortcoming. We will see how far away we might be from the expectation of the Lord. And we will pray like we prayed in the morning. Lord, make me a true leader. God is not looking for the people that have totally arrived. That will say, thank God for that study. I don't have any need at all. I'm qualified through and through. Not by power, not by might. But by my spirit, says the Lord. You know, some years ago, we were having a camp, Christian camp. Not a deeper life conference or deeper life camp, 
It was in the early days of Deeper Life. Deeper Life had started, but uh, it wasn't a Deeper Life uh, conference. I was invited there to preach. And I was given a free hand because they loved me very much and they wanted the little that God has given me to have an impact on them. And I loved them too. I loved the leader and I loved the, uh, his assistant and another brother there. Just, they really loved the Lord. It was, they were a wonderful group of people. And they're still carrying on the ministry. And uh, by the grace of God, they're still doing the best that God has given them to do. And um, we're having a testimony night that night. And the brother came up on stage and he took the microphone. He wanted to give a testimony. And uh, he came on very strong. And he said, praise the Lord, since I became a Christian, never made a mistake, never faltered, and I've been walking my Christian life, and when that devil comes and he tries to tempt me, I just knock him with my Bible and with the word of God, and when I go out to witness, I tell you, God has made me a great soul winner, and I do this and do that, and I was feeling inconvenient. I like successful people, but I don't like people that exaggerate their success. And, you know, he talked and talked, and everybody almost felt none of us can do anything. This man is he's only, he's even more qualified than their leaders in that place. And, you know, the leader, I still remember him, wonderful brother, brother Joshua Hemelan in Omaha. He's not in Omaha now. He traveled abroad. And he came on there, and if you are familiar with that brother, his voice, his look, his everything. And uh, when that person eventually finished, and he, you know, had given that great, great testimony, and you know, everybody looking at him as a mighty giant, Brother Joshua Hemelam came over there, took the microphone in his normal, quiet, gentle manner. He started the chorus, not by power not by might this mountain shall be moved but by my spirit says the lord and when he led that cross in a solemn way we got the message we forgot the giant we remembered jesus christ and there's no giant here tonight not by power as we look at all these qualifications if we feel qualified, we praise the name of the Lord. But I don't look at my other brother. I don't look at the other minister and say, you see now, I have arrived. No, nobody has arrived. But by the grace of God, we are marching on. And the Lord who has helped us to this point will continue to help us more and more in Jesus' name. Now let's look at this, P10 summarizing our discoveries of leadership qualifications in scripture we should look at the following character qualities in ourselves as leaders what are the qualities we're looking for integrity faithfulness commitment to the flock right motives and attitudes shepherd's heart stability ability to get along with others a lover of people all people graciousness in our attitude in our look in our talking sacrificial living bible-based lifestyle being a doer of the word teachableness Submissive spirit and humble heart. Respect for others without competition with them. Being transparent. Having a transparent, open, and honest life. If we have these qualifications in a measure, how we will gladden the heart of our Father God in heaven. If we don't have enough, how the father will still be glad if we go to the throne of grace and we apply and pray and say god i know the picture of the true biblical leader make me one he will do it it may help 
each of us to ponder the following questions. Please think about them as I read them quite clear and slowly to you. Have I believed in Christ? And do I have an abiding witness of the Holy Spirit within me? Do I have the mind of Christ? Or does the Adamic nature with inner corruption and depravity control me? Have I been immersed and baptized in the Holy Spirit? Or do I minister? Do I minister with unction that I have received from the Spirit of God? Or do I minister from the brain alone? Do I stay in close communion with the Holy Spirit? Do I accept the whole Bible as the word of God? Does it produce and control everything I teach and do? Do I love God's people? And do I identify with the people of God in times of need, poverty, affliction, attack, and persecution? Do I truly worship God? with all my heart? Do I have a strong prayer life? Do I have a mature attitude in precious situations? Do I listen to and receive criticisms graciously? Do I let others finish a job that I began without feeling any bitterness towards them? Am I able to accept it when someone else is given a job for which I think I am better qualified? Do I manifest a self-righteous attitude when someone else makes a mistake? Do I accept other people's ministry or suggestions? Or do I always argue for my point of view? Do I give up present pleasures in the light of long-term gains for the kingdom of God? Do I face unpleasant disappointments without any bitterness? Do I forgive people when they deliberately ignore me? Do I freely admit when I'm wrong? Do I have the ability to hold my tongue when quietness is the only thing that will glorify God in a certain situation? Do I accept and live in peace with situations and circumstances I cannot change? May God help us to become the leader he wants us to be. Very briefly, let us talk about commitment qualifications. Commitment. In 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Can I read from verse 1? Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The Lord is expecting that you and I will have the commitment of a son to the father. And that is what Timothy demonstrated. If you read the writings of Paul the Apostle, especially if you read Philippians, you will see the commitment of Timothy as a son to Paul the Apostle. So then, as we examine the commitment qualifications, we need the commitment of a real dedicated son. Verse 2. And the things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is commitment to the word of God we have received. And so he was telling Timothy, he said, the things thou hast received that you have heard learned of me, commit yourself to it. Don't change it. 
Commit yourself to the point that it is exactly the same thing you are going to commit into the hands of other men. Verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He said, Timothy, you know the kind of commitment that is expected from a Christian leader is the commitment of a soldier in the army. Verse 4. No man that worries entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has called, who has chosen him to be a soldier. He says, you are committed to the king of kings, to the captain of our salvation, and you are not going to be living a flabby life like a civilian. In verse 5, and if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. He said, Timothy, have you seen the commitment of those athletes? That those athletes, they just commit themselves completely unto it. You know, once in a while, we read in the papers, and we see the people that are so committed to athletics, that right on the field there, they might have been wounded, injured. They might have been feeling that they are tired, but they keep on playing. They keep on running. And some of them get so committed to it that eventually they even drop dead. And the nation will rise up and they will heal those people and, they, and elevate them. And the newspapers will write about them. What are they writing about? They're writing simply about commitment. Commitment. I read about it, an individual recently, a boxer. And uh, in the last uh, tournament, they just uh, Torn, they just tore his, his, um, his uh, eyeball with the punches. And uh, he wanted to still go on fighting again, but the doctor said, you can't do it. That was the condition of this one eye that had been torn off by the punches. There's nothing you can do about boxing anymore. That's commitment. And the Lord is telling us here that our commitment should be like the commitment of the athlete. Look at verse 6. The husband man that laboreth must first be partaker of the fruits. And think about the farmer, how committed the farmer is. In the cold day, when it just rained all through the night, when the average person will say, I cannot go out in the early morning cold, how the farmer is committed. Not only to sow, not only to build the fence, not only to keep on weeding up the weeds and the tears, but to keep on working until the harvest time. And even after the harvest time, to harvest into the storehouse, we must be committed. Let's look at First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 2. In verse 7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Have you seen the commitment of nursing mothers? The commitment of doctors, medical people, and that's commitment. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. Can you see this commitment here? This is real commitment. And then it says in verse 9, For ye remember, brethren, and labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we will not be chargeable unto you, uh, unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know, how we exalted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. The commitment, children. You can read all the other references, but this one, commitment. All these references, they talk about commitment to the Lord. Commitment to his word. Commitment to the flock. Commitment to service and ministry. Ministering at all costs. The heart of the matter is the condition of the heart of the leader. You see, if the heart is right, there will be commitment. Commitment is not the great physical exhibitions that some people have. 
Commitment may look quiet. Commitment may not do a lot of great, great things that will show that a person has a great ability. A weak person can be committed. A person at a lower level of responsibility can be committed. Everyone can be committed in the place where he finds himself in the work of the Lord. If the leader has truly received the call of God and has a fixed heart, a single heart, an established heart, a pure heart, a purposeful heart, a faithful heart, and a perfect heart, he will, on, he will of necessity be as committed as the Lord requires of him. So all we need to check up is the condition of our heart. Is it fixed on the Lord? Is it purposed like the heart of Daniel and his colleagues, his companions? We're purposed in our heart not to defile ourselves or the king's meat. Is it a faithful heart, pure heart? Is it perfect? And is it single-minded on the call of God? And is it established with grace and the sound doctrine of the Bible? If it is, will be committed. God demands such a commitment from each leader, similar to the true shepherd's commitment for the sheep, similar to Christ's commitment to the Father, similar to the soldier's commitment in the army. It's an uncompromising commitment to the eternal, unchanging word of God. And since we have been redeemed through the great sacrifice of God's only begotten Son, what do you think? Nothing less than Christ's commitment is expected from each God, each of God's appointed leader. And I pray that God will qualify us more and more. Yours is to be willing, and God will do the rest. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord. We're willing. We're willing. That God will qualify us. Whatever he needs to do in our lives, whatever he needs to remold in our lives, whatever he needs to cut off in our lives, whatever character pattern he needs to form in our lives, let's look up to the Lord. Let's be willing that God will do it. Don't be tired. Pray. Are you sure of the call of God upon your life? He calls different people in different ways at different times. But be sure of the call of God. Be sure of the call of God in your life. Has he called you to be a leader? Then you've seen the qualifications expected of us as leaders. Let God work more on you to develop your character. To develop your character. He will if you allow him. Not by power, not by might, by my spirit, says the Lord. Give the Lord a chance. Let him work more and more and more and more in your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you very much for this message. Lord, we thank you for as many as are sure of your call upon their lives. Lord, you assured us in your word. You said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Lord, we realize that you are the one that has called us. 
you are the one that has chosen us. Our call is not of men, neither is our call of ourselves. Lord, you have called us into this leadership role in the church. And you have also exposed to us the qualifications that are needed for the role into which you have called us. Lord, we look at ourselves and we have found ourselves wanting. But now we look up unto you and we are praying, God of heaven, you have called us Come and help us. Make us a leader in Jesus' name. Lord, we are asking that one by one, you'll make us a real leader in Jesus' name. Father, we want to be a Bible leader. We've seen the qualifications. We've seen the standards. But Lord, Something tell, tells us within our hearts that you will make us that leader. Because with you, nothing shall be impossible. And we're not, good, good, we're not going to give up, and we're not going to write ourselves off. But Lord, our eyes are upon you. And we're saying, dear God, perfect your work in our lives in Jesus' name. Lord, you know the various things that are lacking in our lives. Lord, we are praying that as we constantly and continue to call upon you, Lord, you supply all these needs in our lives in Jesus' name. The cry of our hearts. Lord, I want to be a Bible leader. I want to say, do this for us in Jesus' name. And Lord, we are praying that even the commitments of leaders, Lord, we look at our commitments. And we see the commitments in the Bible. We see the standard in the Bible. And we are praying, help us. Help us in Jesus' name. Help us to be more committed. Give us a heart to be more committed to the work you have called us in Jesus' name. Lord, you might not be satisfied with our commitments as at now, but Lord, by your grace, by your power, by your most special working in our lives, we believe we shall be what you want us to be in Jesus' name. Again, we lay our lives before you. I want to say, God, help us. Help us. Help us. Help us, oh God, in Jesus' name. To be the leader you want us to be in Jesus' name. Father, we're praying that none of us will give up. None of us will think it is not possible. As long as we are sure that you called us, that you chose us, and the Spirit is bearing witness in our spirits that you have called us. Lord, we believe you will help us in Jesus' name.